Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you wherever you are joining from around the world. Welcome to the Forward Thinkers webinar organized by the World Future Council. My name is Alexandra Vandel. I'm Executive Director of the World Future Council, and I'm very delighted to be moderating this webinar on the topic of preserving diversity, protecting 30% of the oceans by 2030. We are organizing this webinar on the occasion of the International Day of Oceans, which is held on the 8th of June. The UN has proclaimed this day in order to raise global awareness about the challenges that oceans are facing. Oceans are critical for the survival of all life on Earth, for our health, for climate, for the biosphere, but also for food security. And two days ago, the president of the UN General Assembly, Volkan Voxia, has told a high-level meeting on oceans that the world cannot afford to delay action on ocean protection. Special Envoy of Secretary General on Oceans, Peter Thompson, said to the forum that progress has not been adequate to address the ocean crisis. So today, we will address in this webinar how we can save life on Earth preserve diversity in oceans and protect them, and how we can also make a contribution to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which lists specific targets on reducing pollution, protecting marine ecosystems, tackling illegal and overfishing, and also how to oversee sustainable resource use. Our webinar is organized by the World Future Council, and we believe that we have a duty in the interest of current and future generations to do everything in our power to protect the oceans. We envision a healthy and sustainable planet with peaceful and just societies. And to achieve this, we focus on highlighting and also awarding future just policy solutions for current challenges humanity is facing. In the next one and a half hours, we will be hearing from oceans experts we will be hearing from Dr. Ross Sontag, who is a marine biologist and senior advisor of the World Future Council, who will speak about the work of the World Future Council for Oceans and for protecting 30% of the oceans by 2030. This will then be followed by a presentation by Mrs. Sophie Milgaud, who is special envoy for the ocean of the Belgian government. We then actually hear next from Carolina Schmidt, the Minister of Environment and President of UNFCC COP25. We then see a brief film about the Tubata Reef, which is, was awarded with the Future Policy Award. And then we move on to our Philippine Councillor, who is Executive Director from Safe Philippine Scenes and Councillor World Future Council, Mrs. Anna Oposa, who will speak about good citizenship, turning awareness into actions for our seas. Last but not least, we will hear from Johann Stritt, who is director of the Ocean Race Summit. The Ocean Race wants to be a catalyst for change by accelerating the protection and the restoration of our seas. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your questions in the comment sec session under the chats. Thank you so much. So let me now welcome Dr. Ralf Sontag. So let us hear more about the work you're doing and we're doing jointly on protecting the oceans. Thank you. Please put your loudspeaker on. So I think now it's okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Alexander, for introducing us and me. And uh, it's great to be here. It's great to talk about oceans. For me, oceans are something very fascinating. Oceans are very, something very important. And I think one of the key issues that we do have a healthy ocean. Only with the healthy oceans, we can keep our biodiversity. And this biodiversity is essential for us. And it's especially essential for people, it's essential for human health, it's essential for food resources. More than 4 billion people are actually living 
of uh, at least partly of protein from the oceans. They are living off the oceans. And so we really need them. And we also need the oceans for the health of the whole planet. I mean, every second breath we are taking is coming out of the oceans. And the oceans are actually dealing with one of the biggest problems mankind has caused for this planet, and that's climate change. <clears throat> and so in, uh, in summary, I think we can say that healthy oceans are essential for our survival. But if I look now at these pictures of this, uh, of this big school of jackfish, it's a very beautiful picture. And I've been diving now for more than 30 years, but I've rarely seen something as beautiful than this. But I've seen many times I've seen something like this. Those are bicot uh, fish, which are um, from bottom trawling, and they will be dumped or they will be used as fertilizers. But I think this picture shows us a little bit how we deal with nature and what are the threats of, of nature. And there are actually many more. We just touched upon fishery. That's one of the big issues. We, uh, and fishery is not only affecting, let's say, small fish or also bigger fish. It's also affecting, for example, turtles. And it's affecting the big sharks. Right now is a discussion in progress with the EU, with um, DG Mare of the EU, who is calling again for a quota for a tech of mako sharks, despite the fact that mako sharks already are already endangered. It's something unbelievable, and it's something I'm working very hard on to stop, for example. Another unbelievable, unbelievable issue is the issue of uh, um, whales. There's still whaling going on. Two of the richest countries in the world are going whaling, and two of the richest countries in the world just keep doing it, although they don't need it, and although all these whale populations are actually threatened as well. Another threat is pollution, for example, by ocean-going ships, trash that goes overboard, the exhaust which is there, and ocean noise, for example. And a very new threat is a seabed mining, which is going to cause tremendous problems on the bottom floor of the oceans. So all these things need to be dealt with. World Future Council is working hard in order to address these issues. And there's also, there is every two to three years, the world community is meeting, <clears throat> is meeting in form of the CBD, the Convention of Biological Diversity. And 10 years ago in 2010, at the uh, CBD meeting in uh, Nagoya, Japan, 30, uh, 20 targets have been formed, the so-called IEG targets. They have been developed there and they have been um, agreed upon there. And all these targets are there to deal with all the problems we have on this planet on biodiversity. But I want to look especially on target number 11 here. And target number 11 is actually calling that at least 10% of coastal and marine areas are to be protected by 2020. <clears throat> and the good news is <clears throat> we almost made it. We are now at about 7.6 or 8% of protected areas. And we would have made it if uh, the proposed areas in the Southern Ocean, in the Weddell Sea, in East Antarctica and around the peninsula of Antarctica, if those proposed areas would have been agreed upon, would have been designated by now. And that's another area where the Future Council is working hard on in order to get those um, areas protected. But Russia and China are still blocking. So that's a problem. And we need to uh, address this. Well, 10%, that was, it was the good news that we are almost there at the 10%. The bad news is 10% is by far not enough, not even close. There's many scientists who call for 30%. There are other scientists who call for 50%. Among them, Ed Wilson, who is probably one of the smartest brains in biodiversity in this century. <clears throat> and he calls for nature needs half or half Earth. However, to get like 50% protected in the first go is for some people too ambitious. And so in 2016, a resolution has been passed by the IUCN and this resolution is calling for highly protected MPAs <coughs> without any extractive activities to be protected by 2030. 
So that's another ambitious call, but it's a very, very important call, and that's something we need to work on. And the tool to decide upon it, the tool to achieve it, is the so-called CBD again, the Convention for Biological Diversity. The next time the CBD will meet in Kunming in China and will discuss these issues, will discuss the old Aichi targets, which were set in 2010, which expired last year, and will <coughs> discuss the new targets, which are called now the post-2020 biodiversity framework. And that needs to be adopted in Kunming, China in, um, in the fall in 2021. <coughs> And uh, we will be there, we will participate in the discussion in order to try to bring that forward. But in the meantime, there are, <clears throat> in the meantime, there are initiatives to bring that forward. One is called uh, the High Ambition Coalition or HEC, which is led uh, by Costa Rica, France and the UK. And the High Ambition Coalition is calling for 30% to be protected uh, on land and 30% to be protected in the ocean. And there is the Global Ocean Alliance Goa, led by the UK, which is calling for 30% protected by, um, by, by of the oceans by 2030. So both groups together with the World Future Council, together with many other NGOs around the world, we are working to increase the number of countries in HAC and Goa we are working to reach out to other parties so they become members of those big alliances, which in my opinion are very important. And I think so far we did a relatively good job. If we look at this, we see the members of the High Ambition Coalition, we see the members of the Global Ocean Alliance, and altogether it's about 80 countries which are right now in those two coalitions and more are coming every week. And there's a third smaller coalition, it's led by Belgium. And I wanna keep uh, the suspense here and it's something Sophie is gonna talk about in a minute, I think. So we are on a good way here, but of course we need to get more members. And we need to discuss about the quality of protected areas. What's very important is we don't want paper parks. We don't want parks which are just on paper, which are not enforced, which are not implemented, etc. But some countries are happy with lightly protected areas. And uh, Germany is a good example. Many of the German MPAs are actually only lightly protected. But in our opinion, that's not enough. The EU is calling for strictly protected areas without any definition what strictly protected actually means. The World Future Council together with many NGOs is calling for highly and fully protected areas without any harmful extraction um, out of the sea. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a clear definition for highly and fully protected. And this definition you can find in the so-called MPA guide, which is developed right now and which is almost done. And uh, it's developed by UNEP and it's developed by the IUCN. And here you can see the definitions of uh, fully protected and highly protected. So what are the advantages of highly protected? <clears throat> First of all, if we have a highly protected um, area, the habitat will recover much faster. If we leave it alone, it will recover if we don't do anything. So we need it for recovery, but also the fish in a fully protected area will be larger. The fish will reproduce better and there will be many more fish in this area. So there will actually be a so-called spillover effect in the areas outside of the marine protected area. And that will cause an improved and increased fishery actually for the people. There are many examples around the world where studies have shown that despite the fact that part of an area has been um, designated as a highly protected area, the area all around the, um, this MPA is better for fishing and actually the income of the fishermen has increased in these days. 
In addition, there's in some of these highly protected areas, there's good tourism uh, possible. Many divers uh, can go there, etc. So there are very, very many big advantages. Another big advantage is that healthy ecosystem in fully protected areas, they adapt much easier to climate change. That means the resilience will be better. So that's another very important effect. And uh, so we are very clear, we need highly and fully protected areas. How do we get there? Right now, <clears throat> right now, Substar is meeting. It's a virtual meeting. Normally it would be in Montreal. It's meeting currently and Substar is the scientific body of the CBD, which I mentioned earlier. This scientific body is now looking into the science behind it is looking into, do we need 30% really, or do we need 35, do we need 28? It's looking into the indicators, how can we implement uh, these uh, parks, etc. It's looking in all these scientific aspects. And all these aspects, the conclusions of this meeting, they will go to the so-called open-ended working group where delegations from all over the world will meet and these delegations will discuss the political side of it and they will recommend a decision which needs to be taken then by the CBD COP in October, uh, end of the year. And I think it's, the science is very clear. We know what we want. We do need highly and fully protected areas and that's something we work on and let's hope we're gonna get there. And with that, I want to say thank you very much and in case you want to contact me, there's my email down here. If you want to follow me, there's my Twitter down there. And I'm looking forward to the conversation, to the discussion coming now. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Sontag, for this very good presentation, explain to, explaining to us very clearly why there's such an urgent need to better protect the oceans and what is behind the demand to protect 30% of the oceans or even 50% of the oceans and why we also need this highly and fully protected marine highly and fully protected marine areas you also mentioned the different coalitions that exist among the governments and also the blue leaders initiative and that now leads me on to the next speaker and I would like to welcome Mrs. Sophie Milbo who is representing um, the Belgian government. She is actually the special envoy of the Belgian government. They are coordinating the Blue Leaders Initiative. So Sophie, we are looking forward to hear from you about this initiative and also about the need for a high seas agreement. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, and um, <clears throat> thank you, Perry, for uh, the very interesting background uh, that you just gave into into thirty percent and into CBD uh, negotiations. Uh, so it's it's mentioned before, Belgium is uh, part of the Blue Leaders uh, Alliance, which is one of the numerous uh, thirty by thirty alliances. Where we try to distinguish ourselves is that we have a double goal, let's say. The first goal is that within uh, the 30 by 30 um, uh, objective, so the objective to protect 30%, we um, agree completely with, with, with what uh, Perry said that uh, it cannot be leading us to more paper parks. And so we very specifically indicate that for us, the 30% needs to be highly and fully protected. So that's uh, one specificity of the, of the Blue Leaders Group. The other one is that next to the 30%, which is the, the, the goal, the incentive as such, we are focusing on the tools in order to be able to reach that. And that is the high seas or BB&J uh, agreement. And BBNJ stands for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. So it's the high seas as well as uh, the seabed, but we or the area as it is called in the UN Convention. Uh, but for short, we often say high seas uh, treaty negotiations. Um, and so I, in, in this talk, I will um, uh, mainly focus on the high seas uh, treaty negotiations, the content, as well as uh, the actual current status of the negotiations. Um, and why do I think that this is so important um, to mention in, in correlation with the 30% is that now there is a 10% target, which has elapsed in a, in, in a certain sense uh, in uh, 2020. 
it was not reached uh, by now, even with the most, um, let's say, positive or optimistic or glass half, half full uh, ways of looking at it. It would be 7% uh, or something like that. If, if you're a little bit more critical, it would even be a, a lot less. And one of the reasons for this is that we have at this moment not a true uh, globally opposable system in place to have marine protected areas on the high seas. And with only marine protected areas within national jurisdictions, so in the territorial uh, seas of the states, we will never get to the to the 30%. We probably won't even get to the 10% if you look at the ocean in a in a global uh, or the entire ocean. So we need this high seas treaty in order to be able to reach the 30%. What else is in this high seas treaty? So I will, I will look at the different aspects of this negotiation. We always call it a package. It's a package negotiation. And the package, the holy package, if I can call it like that for negotiators, consists of uh, four chapters. Um, and these are area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. They are environmental impact assessments. Um, capacity building and the transfer of marine technology and marine genetic resources as well as or including uh, access and benefit sharing to these resources. I will go in a little bit deeper uh, into two um, of these chapters. And I mean, this is not a secret. I will lay the cards on the table. These two are the ones that uh, Belgium as well as the EU have been, has been focusing most upon. And they are uh, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas and environmental impact assessments. Um, capacity building and a transfer of marine technology are extremely important tools um, to be able to reach those ambitious um, uh, objectives that we set ourselves. Uh, and we have a, a lot, I mean, there's a lot being discussed in this, but um, they are tools and, and we need to focus on them as, as tools for reaching uh, the objectives. Marine genetic resources, including access and benefit sharing, um, is also a very important aspect of this, uh, but it's it's slightly different in nature, let's say, where um, the environmental impact assessment and the area-based management tools are, are environmental tools uh, or tools to reach environmental objectives. Marine genetic resources has sort of a different uh, perspective and it's more regarding access and, and benefit sharing. So for today's uh, talk, I will focus on, on these two. Um, marine protected areas um, is um, the chapter for which um, I am part of the, the, the negotiating team of the European Union. Um, and so this is the chapter that logically is uh, is, is hence uh, closest uh, to my to my heart. Uh, so we'll start with that. <laughs> you know, it's I won't be saying it's my favorite child, but it's uh, the one that I'm starting with. Let's say. Um, and so with marine protected areas, um, what the EU has been trying uh, to to push is um, a, is is a, um, a procedure that consists of a number of steps in which the step of coordination is extremely important. So there will be a proponent that will put forward a proposal. And how we see it is that the BBNJ Secretariat, the future BBNJ Secretariat, will have an extremely important role in getting everybody around the table. So how we see it is that a marine protected area needs to have um, a management plan. And this is for us a really a key um, necessity in order to have a functioning and an, an actually um, working and not paper marine park uh, is to have a clear management plan. And this management plan, we see it sort of as a box. And this box needs to be filled with different uh, measures. And um, we, we, um, uh, we are dealing with the situation that there are a number of actors already present on the ocean, on the high seas. We have international organizations, including the International Maritime Organization, who deals with shipping, uh, regional fisheries management organizations that deal with shipping, um, that have a mandate um, to regulate a number of activities. And the model, how we see it, is that those organizations will be requested to um, bring measures on uh, regarding a certain area that are within their competence <clears throat> in order to fill the box, in order to fill this um, uh, management plan. And um, the rest of it, so the rest that is not tackled at this moment, um, will come from the proponents and will then be coordinated and get input from the other uh, delegations. 
we really feel like this coordinating aspect is extremely important. Um, and that the uh, COP, which is the conference of the parties, which are all the delegations that are a member to the BBNJ agreement, they need to be able to say, listen, IMO, you have uh, come up with this measure to fill our box, but we have these and these questions uh, that come from an input that we get from our scientific body, uh, which comes from our own inputs, which come from the input from um, civil society. So what is your answer uh, or what is your, what can be a possible um, amendment to your proposed measure that will alleviate uh, those concerns. Um, the, 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 the purpose is that the Secretariat really facilitates a true dialogue between these different um, mandates or between the organizations that hold these different mandates as well as civil society, as well as the scientific um, body. Um, and so when all of this comes together, we hope, or it is our aim, that this will form um, a clear management plan um, which has um, objectives, uh, conservation objectives, as well as conservation measures for a specific area in order to have a functioning marine uh, protected area. We see actually three different scenarios uh, taking uh, place. We see one where there's, for example, already some kind of measure in place. Like for example, there can be um, a fisheries closure that has been decided by a regional fisheries management organization, but this is only concerning one activity. So there we see a role for the BBNJ COP to complement that and to also talk about other um, activities that can have an impact in order to make it a truly holistic marine protected area that's not dealing with just one activity, but that is also looking at, for example, um, uh, shipping um, and the effects of, of, of shipping, um, which is also looking, for example, at marine noise or underwater uh, anthropogenic uh, noise and all the other impacts that can be um, on biodiversity in that specific area so that we don't have a uh, management tool just for one activity, but for something holistic. And that will be what we call the complementing scenario. Then we have the scenario where nothing at all is in place. Um, and there uh, the BBNJ COP will do a marine protected area from scratch basically, because there's nothing in place. And the third scenario is what to do when there is already a marine protected area in place, for example, from a regional um, seas organization. And then it will be, we, it will be the, the task of the BBNJ COP to see how these uh, marine protected areas can be recognized without just simply rubber stamping them. So those are the, the, the three scenarios. We still have a number of challenges in this um, negotiation because one of the most important aspects was that of, of in order to be able to start this negotiation for a number of delegation was that we will not undermine existing organizations. And what is actually that undermining? It is quite difficult to assess what is meant with undermining. Does undermining mean having no effect at all on any of the activities that have anything to do whatsoever with the activity of a certain organization? For example, a, a regional fisheries management organization or um, shipping uh, activity? Um, or does not undermining simply mean that um, we will not hamper the mandate that is currently being exercised by that organization? And so this is something that is still very much open on the table. Um, the same with decision making. Will we strive towards consensus, like is the case for the Antarctic, the, the Kemlar um, um, decision making process? Or will we go towards voting, which is the case for, for IMO actually, even though they hardly ever use it, or for certain other bodies like the Convention on Migratory Species? A question which is still uh, out in the open. Uh, from an EU perspective, we would like to achieve consensus and to do everything necessary to reach consensus. But if consensus cannot be reached, we need to keep the possibility of voting open. Now I will go um, to uh, environmental impact assessments. So um, what is very important in overall for the BBNJ agreement is that the status quo, it was a quote that was often repeated, the status quo is not an option. So the added value of the BBNJ agreement is exactly to overcome that current status quo. Um, and this is particularly relevant in the environmental impact assessments um, uh, chapter. We need to have working and useful environmental impact assessments that also take into account more modern environmental um, um, uh, standards, such as cumulative impact assessments. Uh, there's a number of things that are still very much in the open there as well, which is, for example, um, 
again, this undermining issue, like what to do with current uh, organizations that already have a process for environmental impact assessments. Um, do we undermine them if the BBNJ agreement sets higher standards or do we call that complementing? It's a question which uh, we, we have not found an answer in the negotiation to yet. What to do with land-based activities? We all know that the majority of um, uh, litter coming from the ocean or from pollution in, 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 that's coming into the ocean, including the high seas, is coming from land-based activities. Uh, do we consider that as falling under a treaty which is a treaty called biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction? out in the open and the same with decision decision making should it be a state uh, that decides or should it be the convention of uh, the parties of the agreement what is sure um, or uh, is that th this keeping the, the, the status quo as it is now which is a very general uh, obligation to fulfill an EIA is not what we want um, and just to mention one more uh, aspect of the EIAs where we need to show our ambition is the threshold, uh, starting from when will an EIA kick in? When will we need to do um, an EIA? So these are the, the, the content, and I know my time is probably running, running out already, but I will quickly go to the status of the negotiation. So we have a draft treaty at this moment, but this dates um, from November, or this draft uh, treaty was sent to us in November 2019. We were supposed uh, to have our last uh, intergovernmental conference in uh, March, April 2020, but for obvious reasons, this was delayed. For now, or it had been delayed until August 2021, but um, the latest news on this is that even August 2021 is not a possibility anymore because of the pandemic still uh, being um, uh, quite present in our lives. And the, the, the thing is with these negotiations, when you're at the the end stage of such a long negotiation, you need to be able to <clears throat> sort of literally put your heads together. Um, so having um, um, a negotiation where only, for example, the negotiations are taking place in New York. So if only New York based diplomats could, for example, be able to participate, this would, in, in, in the opinion of many, uh, lead to a lowering of the ambition uh, of, of the treaty, as well as a number of issues would simply be postponed to a COP, a first COP, um, but then we would have sort of an empty treaty. And then the question is, and it, it's very, it's a very difficult dilemma actually, is it uh, better to delay or to post and, and to postpone, or is it better to go for a treaty which goes into less detail? Um, the general feeling, and this is the reason that, that the BBNJ um, Intergovernmental Conference will be delayed uh, to hopefully as, er I mean, as early as possible in 2022, um, will be that it's better to aim to do it right and to, to aim at this, which is one of the biggest negotiations on, 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 on ocean issues in the past decades, that we have only one shot and we need to do it right. And the risk of delaying things to a first COP is that we will be delayed even more. And, and, and by that, I mean that you could say, for example, OK, um, the decision making within marine protected areas will just delay it to the first COP and that we feel like the risk is bigger than. Um, so the, the, the president of the negotiations has will any time now um, um, have uh, the General Assembly ask for a, a postponement. Um, so um, this is uh, the, these are the messages that I wanted to give about this uh, negotiation, which I think is the tool in order to make uh, 30 by 30 come true. Um, and I will now pass the floor uh, back uh, to, the, to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, very much for, first of all, for your work and your, the work of your government for really working towards this high seas agreement and protecting 30% of the oceans by 2030 and giving us all the inside information and underlining the critical importance of having such an agreement. I'm sure there will be more questions from the audience, but uh, before we turn on to the next speaker, there is actually, there are more governments who are members of the Blue Leaders Alliance. And we now will also have a brief statement from Chile, actually it's the Minister of the Environment of Chile, who was also the president of the UN Climate Cop. So let's, uh, let us briefly hear now from Carolina Schmidt. Chile supports increased ambition in ocean conservation. We also support the effective implementation 
of marine protected areas. We have to move forward to a sustainable management of the ocean. Science has shown us that ocean is suffering devastated consequences by the climate change that we need to address urgently. At the Blue COP25, all countries stood together to formally acknowledge the connection between climate and oceans to ensure the integrity of its ecosystems. The health of our planet is critical to people's well-being. For a healthier planet and a healthier future, as a blue leader, Chile supports the protection of our ocean and calls for 30 by 30. Thank you very much for these introductory presentations on what is required at the international level. We will now want to look into required national action. You know, the World Future Council has given the Future Policy Award on Ocean and Coast. This was already in 2012, actually, but we have done a review again of the awarded policies and the impacts are impressive. And now we want to have a look into the Tupataha Reef Natural Park Act from the Philippines, which is actually a very effective marine protected area. And let us take a little journey to the Philippines and see a film. So enjoy the film. Close your eyes and imagine this. You are looking into an unfathomable, endless blue sea calls to you. You are irresistibly drawn to what lies beneath the surface. And then you plunge into a new world. A world so unlike the one above it, yet which looks and feels familiar. A place of extraordinary beauty, where the colors of nature astound. Where mighty currents spread life over vast distances. A world of abundance and power, fragility and tenderness, mystery and magnificence. It is one of the world's greatest marine ecosystems, and it is here in the Philippines. Open your eyes, because this world is real. This is Tubataha. The Samal people call it a long reef exposed at low tide. It is a gem in the middle of the Sulu Sea, 90 nautical miles from Puerto Princesa, Palawan. Explore 97,000 hectares of the dramatic seascapes of Southeast Asia's only purely marine UNESCO World Heritage Site and let it fill your senses. Two atolls on the north and south formed over millennia and an adjacent reef known as Jesse Beasley make up the Tupataha Reef's natural park. It sits at the apex of the Coral Triangle, global center of marine biodiversity, sheltering most of the corals found on the planet. Rare and endangered creatures from microscopic blooms to massive whale sharks find a haven here. Ascending to the surface, you discover that the splendor below is reflected in the beauty of the land and the sky. For Tupataha nurtures even above water. Bird Islet on the North Atoll, a globally important rookery, reverberates with the calls of tens of thousands of seabirds. In the South Atoll, a lighthouse guides mariners across the treacherous waters of the Sulu Sea. While in the north, only through our shared understanding and commitment can Tubataha remain a reality, a dream well within our reach. All you have to do is open your eyes. The Tubataha Natural Park Act was selected by an international jury for the, for the Future Policy Award on Ocean and Coast. And it was selected because it's an excellent model 
for marine conservation. And we also see very effective management into Bataha. Uh, also local communities are strengthened. In addition to that, there are legislative power to address and fight illegal fishing. There is in Tupaha comprehensive training for marine park rangers, ensuring that each individual is familiar with the law enforcement process. And they all learn about basic ecology and management objectives of the Natural Park Act. So we are very happy also to have with us today our counselor from the Philippines, Mrs. Anna Oposa from Safe Philippine Seas. And we will now hear about her work in the Philippines and Asia for good sea citizenship. Welcome, Anna. Hi, Alexandra. Thank you for having me again. I'm Anna. Um, I am the executive director and chief mermaid of an NGO in the Philippines called Save Philippine Seas. And I have been a world future counselor, world future council counselor since I was 23 years old. So it's been 10 years. Um, it's, it's a good uh uh, family to be part of. So this is my intro slide. Um, I have a dog. I love reading and I love lipsticks, um, but I also do a lot of work on uh, marine conservation and the environment. So this is the logo of my NGO and all our projects fall under three pillars. One is engagement. So we work with different government, we, we work with different um, uh, institutions, and we also work on education. So pre-pandemic, we used to travel all over the Philippines and all over the world, all over the region, educating people and why we need to care about this use. And most importantly, we work on empowerment issues. So we work with different citizens. We like to call our community citizens because we want to remind them that we are all connected to the sea, no matter where we live. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you a few lessons from our advocacy. But before that, give me a second to tame my dog child. Yes. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so first lesson is to use your imagination. And SPF started out as a social media social media movement with no budget and no money. So we had to do a lot of like, we had to use a lot of free resources. And it's a lack of resources that have made us resourceful. You might have heard or read that the Philippines is the social media capital of the world. Filipinos spend the most time online, more than any other nationality in the world. So we wanted to maximize this. And we've done a lot of fun campaigns writing on pop culture. So we remember when Pokemon Go was super famous, we made a campaign on sharks uh, using inspired by Pokemon Go. We also use our platform to talk about things that are hard. So we had a campaign called Eco Guilt, where we openly want to talk about the challenges of uh, managing or reducing our waste. And because Filipinos are known to be romantic people, we came up with a campaign called Waste Free Weddings, where we encourage people who are going to get married to reduce their waste. And of course, we can't love something if we don't know it. So we always promote um, appreciation or learning to appreciate our oceans. Pre-pandemic, we used to take a lot of kids um, and Filipinos out into the sea. And we're always surprised that 80% of our participants, 80 to 90% of our participants, um, have never been in the water. And that's crazy knowing that the Philippines is an archipelago with over 7,000 islands. So these are pictures of children who live in islands and they've never been in, in the water. Uh, we also do a lot of um, education programs. So if we can't bring the, the, uh, them to the sea, then we bring the sea to them. But of course, we know that young people matter. Now more than ever, we recognize how powerful the voices of young people are. And several years ago, I had the opportunity to create my own youth program. And I wanted it to be everything that that I dreamed of when I would when I was younger. So we you know we took people outdoors. We brought them near mangroves and corals and seagrasses. 
But what's different about this youth program is that we actually make them implement projects by the end of the week. Uh, we would group them together and we would give them a small amount of, of funding so that they get to experience what leadership in environmental movement really means. So it's not just sitting there and listening and writing down notes, but really um, practicing it and learning to get rejected and learning to, to hear people saying no to you because there's no activist or advocate that always gets yeses. And at 22, at 18, we want them to learn that. Because for Safe Philippines, these young people are not just leaders of tomorrow. They can also be leaders of today, but they have to be given the right opportunities and the right guidance and skills to be able to do that. So we are most passionate about empowerment, like I mentioned earlier. So it's turning education into action. So it's not just memorizing things or knowing the facts, but how do we use that information to make a difference in communities? One of the projects that we've been doing for many years is called Waste Watchers. And um, we have campaigns called Straw Wars, which reduces the straws. We were doing this even before um, straws became a famous uh, topic. Uh, we worked on reducing bottles, plastic bottles, especially in islands where there's no recycling facility or the, the waste isn't removed from the island. So we created different materials. Um, all of this was made by our sea campers, like all our youth participants. And we put them all on the Save Philippine Seas website into these toolkits. Um, we have Waste Watch toolkits that everyone can download for free. And when we were curating this, my question was, at 18, what kind of materials did I wish I, ha I had back then that would make it easier for me. So we have a deck, we have letters, we have stickers, we have posters, anything you can imagine, you can download it for free from the Safe Philippines Seas website into these toolkits. Now, for the past year, we've really been struggling because, um, as all, all of us are, we we had a hard time trying to imagine making people fall in love with the sea when we can't even be near it or we can't even see it, we can't travel to it. So we've been spending our time still creating materials. So last year, we came up with um, an infographic called Plastics in the Pandemic because I don't know about you, but my plastic waste has increased so much in the last year because of all the deliveries and all the packages and all the fear of contamination. So we used a lot of scientific references. We read peer-reviewed journals and made them simple. And the infographic is called Plastics in the Pandemic Fact versus fears. And then we came up also with a reusers manual where we give tips on reusing uh, materials so that you don't feel scared that you're going to get like contaminated materials. We also um, thought a lot about climate change and gave ourselves a communications challenge. How do we make climate change simple and understandable and empowering um, instead of, you know, giving eco-anxiety? So if you know, if you have an iPhone, you know Siri, and we created Hey Siri so that it's more related to our brand. And this year, I'm, I'm so happy to announce that we were able to launch a program called Change the Current in partnership with the Department of Education. And it's funny because when I was 25 years old, I actually wrote a letter to the Department of Education saying that we need to work together. And of course, I was ignored. And that's okay. It took eight years for this dream to come true. So we created this um, online training program for 10 to 14-year-old uh, children and um, another set for 15 to 19 for 15 to 19 years old and we call them the climate change makers and I was very deliberate about creating modules that are fun you, you know you learn a lot and you do learn all the scary facts about climate change but in the end the there are 15 students who will receive $300 to implement projects in their community and maybe for some of us, this amount is small, but if you're 15 years old living in, a, in an island community, that's a lot of things that you can do. And of course, we're continuing the mentorship and the guidance. And since we're all at home, we wanted to make it interactive. So we have energizers and role play activities, and we encourage them to create content because the Gen Z, they're super creative with, with their materials. Um, and we have videos. We really wanted to make it 
relatable instead of scary. Because in, in say, Philippine Seas, we really believe that we can't preach to the choir. We have to build the choir and reach audiences that are not necessarily already part of our target audience. And ultimately, even if we do have a lot of problems in ocean conservation, we should never take ourselves seriously. And when we when we do shark work, so Perry and I, or Ralph, Dr. Ralph and I have worked on shark uh, work together, shark conservation work together, and we always come up with fun activities like these mascots. We used to make them walk around um, the city and talk to different people and sing baby shark just to make people feel that sharks aren't scary. And these are just some of the ways that we've made waves. And this month, or last month, a few weeks ago, actually, Save Philippines Seas celebrated its 10th anniversary. And in many ways, I feel like we're just beginning. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to um, seeing questions or comments and having a discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, so much for your inspiring presentation. It's wonderful to have you in the World Future Council and to follow what also all citizens can do because we have invited to this webinar policymakers, society representatives, scientists, business, but also we have citizens and we are all citizens. We can all make a wave, as you said, to help protect the oceans. So let me now uh, turn over because we now still have a last presentation and I, we will be introducing the ocean race now with a short presentation. They are very active in this very critical year of the ocean. So let us first get a glimpse about what the ocean race is about and what they are doing. Thank you. <laughs> Not be a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. We really need to act. So let us step on the air. Johan Stritt, who is director of the Ocean Race Summit. We are very pleased to have you with us. So please, Johan, tell us more about your work at the Ocean Race Summit and your important work to protect the oceans. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, film that we just saw is uh, our, so it's, it's, an, it's a brainchild of our race director, Richard Breeses, and, and the UN envoy for the ocean, Peter Thompson. Uh, it was born already in 2019 and, and was planned to do, of course, for, for last year. But since everything is pushed forward due to the pandemic, we have pushed, for, pushed forward this Relay for Nature. And the simple idea of this is to gather uh, <clears throat> commitments and calls for action uh, uh, that ties all these important uh, conferences where the world comes together to make important decisions. Uh, and to gather support for those initiatives. Um, I think it's fair to start uh, with a question. Uh, the ocean race, we are a sport competition. Uh, we are a sailing race. Uh, we, uh, we are in that sense, no difference from uh, the world championships in soccer or something like that. So why would we do this? Why would we engage for the ocean? Well. Uh, first, it is clear to us that we have something that is very special in our sport, and that is the determination of our sailors. They are fantastic athletes. They are gathering in teams, sailing across the globe. Uh, and we think that this determination, this ambition shown by the sailors is something that we can harness and use uh, to drive for the ocean. I mean, it's obvious that we have a particular uh, interest in the ocean and here it's in our name. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, Perry, you started by 
pointing out the crucial role of the ocean for, for humanity and for the ecosystems and, and for the nature of the world. Um, it is our support system and that's important for us to, to recognize that and, and work on that. Uh, the ocean has, has its rights of its own to be focused on. Um, but to us as a sport, it's also uh, what Sophie talked about. The, uh, we are out on the high seas. We are actually having the high seas as our field of play. That's where our sport goes around. Um, and, and this this links us very close to the ocean. Our sailors, our athletes are passing the high seas. They are meeting illegal fishing fleets. They are sailing through garbage belts uh, and they are uh, meeting uh, the, the decline in, in, in sea, in life, in the ocean. Um, we have young sailors that heard from older sailors that sailed a few races ago that they would meet mammal lives in the ocean uh, to a high extent. And now they feel that they are not meeting them at all. We have sailors that are participating in one ocean race and feel a decline in, in, in wildlife to the next ocean race. So our sailors are very trustworthy and, and, and true ambassadors for, for, uh, for ocean life and for ocean health. They simply expect us as uh, the ocean race to act on, on, uh, on ocean uh, protection. Being a sport, uh, we also believe in clear rules and it's so good to hear Sophie's work uh, uh, through the EU on, on the world level on the BBNJ. Uh, we do absolutely believe that the, the ocean needs a rule book that is functioning as uh, our sport has one. Um, and uh, we are seeing that, that uh, there is so much going on, as you saw in this Relay for Nature film, uh, in the uh, negotiations and global negotiations. Uh, so we need to support that. But I think it's also important for us as the ocean race to raise our eyes and have a look further into the future. Because I don't think that any of us really truly believe that the conferences and the negotiations right now will, will once and for all solve the issue of ocean protection and, 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 and a management and governance system to protect it. So we are, we are driving now towards having the Ocean Race Summits, which is a high level uh, conference series that goes across the globe in a virtual format uh, to focus on all the work that has been done when it comes to nature's rights and ocean rights the notion of nature having rights of itself. We can see a growing global movement with the actions taking in countries like New Zealand, where a river has got rights, legal rights, and in Ecuador, where there are elements of this in their constitution. Uh, and there is a global growing movement towards nature's rights. Uh, and we would like to explore that further together with this movement. Is there elements in the notion of ocean rights and nature's rights that can sort of pave the way for a possible next step in the global ocean conversation and the global conversation on, on a better protection and governance of the oceans. Um, we don't know, but we have a platform. Uh, when we have a race going, we have billions of followers. We have billions of social media hits. We have a huge amount of people following our sport. Uh, we have a, a tremendous footfall of people coming in and visiting us in our, uh, in our port cities, uh, which we hope will happen now after the pandemic. Our next race starts in October 2022 again. So we have an opportunity and also an obligation to use this power that we have to drive these issues. And we also have the obligation to use the special relationship that we have to the ocean as sailors uh, to, to, to take the next step, to look to the future, to look are there possibilities to drive the idea of giving the ocean rights in its own right. And we have the obligation to use this determination of our sailors, of our athletes, taking on the mission impossible to actually sail around the globe uh, and succeed with it. So that's in short what we are uh, planning to do from our uh, 
from our side and, and I'm uh, happy to leave over to you again, Alex, Alexandra. Okay, thank you so much, Johan. So thank you very much for bringing together the sailor community. Obviously the sailors really love the oceans and they also really can witness the deteriorating situation that we can see, be it pollution or exploitation of the oceans and trying to connect them with global change makers and also engaging youth. And you're actually about to launch a very exciting project in Europe. So let us see a brief film. Thank you. for this exciting film and your report about your activities. I have now received a number of questions actually addressed to all of the speakers. And before we, I will raise these questions, just let me mention that this webinar is also part of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. This decade actually will be launched next week on the 4th of June. And the decade will run until 2030 in order to aim to restore and protect our ecosystems to benefit people and nature. So let me now just have a look into the questions that I received. I will now start first um, questions to Dr. Sontag. Um, there's a question about the CBD meeting that you mentioned and the new plan post 2030, 2030 biodiversity targets. So the question is how realistic is it to reach these ambitious goals? And why are Russia and China opposing as they are also very much affected by climate change? This is the first question. Then I have uh, a second question to you. And this is, you mentioned that there is a challenge with macro sharks. So could you explain a little bit why this is a challenge and what can be done about it? Then let me raise on to Sophie. Already you can um, prepare it. There is a question to you asking how do negotiators deal in the high seas agreement with interests like mining or oil drilling and that some countries might have in designated MPAs? And also when the treaty would come into force, would it take, wouldn't it take too long to tackle all the challenges? Is this the only possible measure to pack the oceans as high seas agreement? So these are the two questions I got so far. So I first would like to ask uh, Perry and Sophie to answer these two these questions, please. Well, thanks. Well, how realistic are the objectives? There are currently there are many discussions. There are these uh, SABSTA meetings, and in the SABSTA meeting there are very substantial discussions, and I have participated in most of these uh, meetings, and I do think people are realizing that we do need these targets. And there's a lot of positive feedback, but there are countries who are blocking currently. And uh, it's difficult, Russia and China are right now difficult on many of these issues. And it's a very good question why, I'm not quite sure. And uh, um, because it's right, they are affected as well by climate change, etc. And uh, so they should actually agree with the rest of the world in order to to make these decisions and hopefully there will be good decisions we got some positive signs from china now on at least on the 30 by 30 and even russia has uh, sent some 
positive signs on 30 by 30. So that's a good thing. Now we need, as Sophie said, we really need this BB&J uh, agreement, which is very important in order to actually bring life into all these uh, discussions and into the targets in the end of the day. So that's one thing. The other thing you were asking about the sharks, this is really, it's a, in my opinion, it's an unbelievable thing which is happening there. I mean, sharks and rays are currently among the most endangered vertebrates on this planet. Sharks especially are hunted because of the shark fin trade, which is in the end just there to, to make shark fin soup, which doesn't taste like anything. And uh, most of the big pelagic sh sharks are actually endangered. Many of them are down to 20%, 10% of the original population. And one of these species is the mako shark. The mako shark is in all the oceans. It's also in the North Atlantic. And right now they are discussing the future of the mako shark. And countries like Canada are calling for a complete ban on the catch or complete um, retention ban. So no sharks can be landed. But the EU is still calling for uh, a quota of 500 tons to be landed. And we find that unacceptable. And this has to stop. All scientific advice is against it. The, scientific, the science is very, very clear on it. It is like no retention of the sharks at all. And that's one issue we are working very hard on and try to stop the DG Mare to do this. Does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We move on to Sophie. And Sophie, I have another question on MPAs. You mentioned that currently we have um, almost 7% protected. And there's a question if in the 7%, um, actually uh, the marine protected areas are protecting from fishing or are there other activities trying to limit fishing and also the bycatch? Sophie, we can't hear You're you muted. right now. <laughs> Better now? Yes, please. Uh, apparently, I had muted myself in two ways, <laughs> so I only unclicked one. Um, okay, so the first question I got was how uh, to negotiate. How do negotiators deal with the fact that there's mining uh, and oil drilling uh, taking place, and how does that affect the position of uh, of certain countries? Um, well, um, it, it, it does, undeniably so, even though a lot of the, 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 the drilling uh, for oil and even the mining takes place within national jurisdiction, so which would then fall outside the scope of the future uh, BBNJ treaty, there's, of course, countries that might have ambitions uh, to, to mine and to drill um, outside national uh, jurisdiction. Um, and this... Um, um, let's say this has a risk to limit their ambitions in, in, in two ways, both in the negotiations at this point. So in order to step to set up the procedure for the creation of uh, marine protected areas, as later on, once we will have the, um, the treaty in place uh, in any discussion on um, certain concrete proposals on marine protected areas, this will also um, limit their ambitions uh, in that sense. Um, however, I could say that um, the real problems, and, and I'm coming a little bit to the second question, what we see in the in the negotiation at this point, so the negotiation about setting the procedure on how um, to um, adopt marine protected areas, as well as the decision on what type of decision mechanism we will have, so consensus or a voting mechanism, um, I would say that the divide is not necessarily between those that that uh, countries that the actually in 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 their own territorial seas do oiling um, or oil drilling and mining etc. It's more the 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 usual suspects divide, uh, let's say, uh, and and the one that Perry just mentioned already, or or the one. Uh, uh, that he mentioned in his in his response to the question. So we see that um, those countries that are hesitant on multilateralism in general are hesitant in this uh, particular negotiation more so than countries who um, have um, um, oil drilling ongoing or mining um, ambitions. So um, th th what we see is that the um, 
the break on ambitions is more on the concept of how you see international law and multilateral relations and the role of the UN and the fact of whether the UN is supposed to be or the UN or any multilateral treaty is supposed to have any decision making power and make any take any real decisions that go beyond negotiations, uh, recommendations or resolutions or whatever. Uh, that is more of an obstacle than actually the, the ambitions or the, or I mean, in, in that case, the, the, the mining and oil drilling ambitions um, or, or the actual activities of a country. And so this takes me actually a little bit to the, to the second question, which is, um, is this the only way to tackle? Is the BBNJ agreement the only way to tackle this? It's definitely not the only way to tackle it, but with not having it, it would definitely hamper any ambitions beyond national jurisdiction. I know that there's, um, for example, I will take a very concrete example. Uh, there is the Sargasso Sea Commission, which is um, um, a joint initiative uh, of a number of uh, states uh, to protect the Sargasso Sea, which is a very particular and, and magnificent habitat um, and breeding ground, etc. It has a, all the reason, it checks all the boxes to become a marine protected area. And there's a limited amount of countries that voluntarily uh, decided to work on uh, conservation objectives. Um, but this is a voluntary initiative that has very limited participation and that has no enforcement aspect uh, of it. This is not international law. It's a it's a gentleman's agreement. Um, as such, it cannot be convincingly taken to the fora of uh, other big organizations as. Uh, in, in saying this is a, a piece of international law and it needs to be respected. Uh, if, 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 so this is definitely something that is needed in complement to international law, um, but we need every type of initiative. Um, I may be very biased because I've been working on, uh, on uh, BBNJ issues, but my take is that um, it is necessary Absolutely, it is vital that this agreement uh, will be taken, even if it will take some time. Everything in the UN, everything with multilateralism takes time, uh, but it is definitely not the only thing that one can do. Uh, and then regarding the 7%, well, I mean, the fact that I'm saying that uh, you can assess uh, or depending on the assessment that you take, either 1% or 7% is protected, depends exactly on what you call protected. And some people call protected something where uh, even uh, hardcore fisheries is still ongoing, but it has some kind of label uh, and uh, some kind of, I don't know, uh, compensation activity is taking place or something. So it very much depends on your definition of a marine protected area, whether you call it 7% or whether you say we reach 7% or 1%. Um, and in if you count the 7%, which is the ambitious or let's say the optimistic way to count it, definitely there are areas in which uh, fisheries is still taking place. Okay, I hope that answered you, the Sophie. question. Thank you, Sophie. So we still have a lot of work to do. That's what I hear from maybe, your statement. Let me maybe. now get back to the questions to Anna and Johan, because we also have questions addressed to them. So first of all, Anna, uh, there's a question about your credo is turn education into edu edu action. And this sounds familiar to what UNESCO is asking for, implementing education for sustainable development in the school setting. So would you suggest to include oceans also as a topic in the curricula of schools? It's the first question to you. And the second question is addressed to you, but also to Johan. And um, how can children and youth be more involved in securing oceans and marine life? And then there's a further question to Johan. How do your sailors actively participate in ocean protection? And how is this possible during the race? So first of all, over to Anna, please. Thanks for those questions. Those are really good questions. Um, to the first question, if uh, oceans should be a, a part of the curriculum, I think my answer is going to be pretty obvious, but of course I'm going to say yes. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, Ralph um, laid out the context of how important oceans are to everybody, you know, every other breath we take is part of it. If we think about climate change, the ocean is our biggest um, carbon sink. Like we can't live without the ocean. Um, so, you know, if we learn math and we learn other essential lessons, then definitely I would argue that oceans are, are also essential in our education. And maybe if we 
had learned about them, about the importance of the oceans earlier, then we wouldn't be in this crisis. I think there's really a lack of education materials on, on the oceans. Um, and the second question on children and youth, um, I think now we have a lot of options to expose children and youth to environmental issues and ocean issues. Um, there are documentaries, there are books, there are so many kinds of multimedia learning materials that are accessible. A lot of them are free, like on YouTube. Um, and also, of course, bringing us more connected to nature by spending time outside. After spending a year and a half in our homes, now even more, we realize how much how much happiness and how how important um, our connection to nature is. So I'll I'll end there and turn it over Thank to you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. So, Johan, could you also elaborate a little bit on this because you also work with children and youth? And please uh, unmute yourself. An obvious mistake. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, for, for uh, children and youth, um, so I think it's um, at the core of, of, of our work with children and youth is, is an educational program that is sort of stimulating to, to search for more knowledge and be, become active and, and make uh, changes. I think also, uh, in addition to that, uh, Anna had a very good perspective of this, that young people are not the leaders of tomorrow they can also be the leaders of today and 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 i hope that through our educational program we can contribute to that perspective um and 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 to to empower young people to to take that role um i think also one thing that is important from us as an organization when we work with young people is is quite often we make them tokens uh, rather than uh, actual subjects that have an opinion that is of relevance and is of extreme importance for us as organizers of these kind of events, offering a platform and so on to young people, that we also give them the full uh, mandate and uh, trust them to deliver key messages that are for real. I think that one person that had put a focus on the, the strength of that is of course Greta and, and, and all, all the Gretas of the world that has stepped forward and say, well, hey guys, you are the ones not doing what is needed. And we should listen to that and we should provide a platform to do it. So that is one thing. And for the sailors, uh, how they can actively participate uh, well, as you saw in this short film, I mean, a number of our boats have scientific equipment on board making uh, uh, sort of taking, uh, making tests along the route when, while they are sailing and gather knowledge. And I think that is one very important thing for, for just our sailors, since we are sort of sailing through the areas of the globe that not many other vessels are going to. Uh, and that means that we can actually gather uh, samples that is of high interest for for science, but of course there are more 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 things to this, and 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 that that is that our sailors they are some sort of superheroes uh, in in those that follow the race. They're role models. They have large followers, uh, large numbers of followers following the race, and 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 they have media platforms of of, of themselves, and they are to a very large extent being role models and examples. Uh, that set the course uh, forward. But I think uh, it's a mixture of that. And then of course we provide opportunities to participate in very concrete actions and, 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 and be part of our summit platforms and others and beach cleanups and whatever what we are doing while, while we're on the race. Thank you so much, Johan. So we have a final question addressed to Perry, to Dr. Rassontag, and then we come to our concluding round. So the question to you is, regard, it's actually from Herbert Girardet, and it's regarding the ocean, we must consider a hierarchy of impacts. First of all, local exploitation by coastal communities. Second, pollution via rivers and sewage pipes. Third, overfishing for global interest. And fourth, climate impacts such as sea level rises. Fifth, Asian acidification via CO2 disk charge. Should the latter be the overarching concern for an organization concerned with the well-being of future generations? Yeah, I think Herbert has, uh, is completely right with all the issues he's mentioning here. And 
I mean, there's not much more I can say except that I fully agree with him on these issues and that we need to address them. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that was very clear. So thank you so much. But now we, I want to come to our concluding round. So I just would like to invite all the panelists just to make a brief two minute statement, just to conclude with your final statement about what are really the required actions that are required in this critical year 2021. So let's start with Dr. Santa. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for the good questions and for participating in this. And I was wondering if you know this little story of two planets meeting each other in space. It's Venus and Earth. Venus is asking Earth, so how are you these days? Earth is answering, oh, I'm not so fine. I'm feeling a bit dirty. I'm feeling very hot. I think I have a fever. Venus is answering, well, I know this, I had this too. It's, it's this disease, it's called humans, but it goes away after 2000 years or so. So don't worry. And well, I, I'm not sure when this conversation took place actually, but I do think there's a lot of truth in this conversation and uh, we have to address it, these issues. And I think we have this year, we have a unique chance to address them. We have the process of BBNJ and we have the process of CBD. Both of these processes are right now, they will decide upon decades to come, I think. And uh, we need to make it right. We need to make a BBNJ as strong as possible with a mandate as strong as possible. And we need to have CBD with strong targets which are really addressing the issue and which will be implemented. I think that's the chance we have right now. And that's something we have to work on and we have to follow. And uh, with that, I say thank you that I have, that I could be here. Thanks. Thank you. Sophie? From my perspective, I think what the message that I would like to give is that we need to keep the momentum high. So we did, I mean, we uh, we called 2020 the year of the ocean before, before it started. And because of uh, completely different circumstances, we weren't able uh, to, to uh, move ahead. Um, and the same is sort of happening in 2000. I mean, if anything will happen, it will be at the end of 2021 and, and maybe 2022 rather than 2021 uh, itself. And it takes a lot to keep this momentum high. Uh, and this is what we will really need to do. And this is what you are doing now with seminars or webinars like this one. Um, and I think that with people uh, like Anna, for example, who I really, I have to say, I'm completely inspired by you I uh, will go to your website uh, as soon as this webinar is over because you are the type of person that we need in order to make people care about this um, and if people care about this and give us this message then also as as government representatives we know that uh, we are backed up by by a very large voice um, so for me the biggest challenge now is to keep this pressure uh, on government negotiators until we actually get to do the, the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie, for this call to action. So over to Anna, please. My key message or, or take home message is to, and this is, well, we in, in say Philippines, you say corroborate, but it's really to collaborate with different stakeholders. Um, I think we have a tendency to work in silos and, you know, NGOs don't like working with corporations and corporations don't like working with NGOs or if someone's in government, um, we all automatically don't like to work with them because we have certain expectations of what they can and cannot do. But I always joke that, um, say, Philippines thesis is, is like the Switzerland of NGOs because we like to work with different um, stakeholders. And in listening to each other, and, and I mean listen to listen and not listen to win because those are two completely different, different things. Um, but when we listen to listen and hear where other people are coming from, I think we can make better decisions that take into account the needs and the impacts of our decisions on different stakeholders. So I'll just end with that. And, and I hope that more people will be encouraged to sit in the same table with people that they normally wouldn't sit beside. Thank you so much, Anna, for underlining again the importance of working together in order to save the oceans with different stakeholders. 
And this is exactly what we're trying to achieve in the World Future Council and also with the ocean race. So please over to you, Johan. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, to end, uh, I think I will go back to uh, the determination and drive of our sailing teams. Uh, you know, they are elite athletes. Uh, they are never content uh, with their actions because they know that in every single action they are doing can be improved. Uh, and that is the perspective we would need to drive into the year or the decade of the ocean. Um, and, and we have to bring that into a wider team of, of governments, NGOs, business, academia, media, uh, influencers to work as a team and never be content until we are there. And there's a long way to go and we have to work on that every day. And therefore, I also think in support of the very important work that Sophie is doing on the negotiation table, we should also dare to put our eyes a bit further ahead beyond the ongoing negotiations and see what are the next steps and explore new concepts for, uh, new, uh, for, for the global community. For example, to explore the ideas of nature's based rights and ocean rights. Well, thank you so much. Our time is actually now coming to an end. I would like to end the session with a huge gratitude to our esteemed panelists. So to Sophie, to Anna, to Johan and to Ralph for accepting to participate today and to share your knowledge and your expertise. And I want to thank all of our cherished participants and listeners for attending. And we really do hope that you will now also join the community to become activists and change makers to protect the oceans and to really make a wave in this very critical year because as Sophie said we need to keep up the momentum in order to really effectively protect the oceans and they are our future. So I also want to thank our entire team and the World Future Council who have helped behind the scene to set up the webinar. So Anna Larastein, Maurice Vaucure, Miriam Peterson, Samia Kassit, Gesa Deukemeyer, who helped to make this a success. Thank you all for your efforts and dedication. If you like this webinar, please tell your friends and colleagues about it. It is still available also on Facebook and can be watched afterwards. Also, you're invited to follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn for subsequent sessions of the Forward Thinkers webinar series. So thank you again for joining us today and see you another time. Goodbye.